Welcome to the fifth episode of Kent's Garage. We've been hard at work here. You know, I'm looking at this 240D and particularly all the work we're doing on the engine compartment. And it may take a couple more episodes, but that's okay. We'll just keep working along here. You can see I've removed a bunch of parts from the engine in the engine compartment. These are things I can clean up and paint off the engine. The first is this fan shroud. Most of these fan shrouds get really ugly. The plastic gets faded. They get beat up and, and real dirty. So I'm going to take you through the process later on how we're going to clean up and make this fan shroud look like new. The other thing is I noticed when I removed the air filter housing that it looked kind of weird. I said, now just a minute here. I think somebody has cut that off. And you can see where someone has bent the metal back. And now I recall when I first got the car, the owner had installed a Raycor water separator filter on that side of the inner fender panel, and I think he cut this off because it was in the way of that filter. Well, I think that's kind of ugly, and it's not original either. But fortunately, I've got another air filter housing back there in my stock. Look at that. Isn't it nice to have used parts laying around? Because now we can clean this up. This is filthy. And we're going to clean it all up and paint it. And then we've got a couple other things, you know, the, the pulley, anything that I can get off the engine and spray paint it, it's going to be a lot easier than using a brush like I'm going to show you a little bit later where we're going to work in and around the engine. And then finally we pull this coolant hose off because it's rusty and I was concerned about the ends being rusty underneath the hose and sure enough they were and I'll show you a little bit later how we we're able to get this off as well. So we've got all these parts, you know, here's the top of the air filter housing. Just wait until you see how nice this is going to look after we clean and paint it. Where I'm at right now is I've got the engine compartment completely cleaned up. That's the first thing I wanted to do is get the engine compartment clean and then we're gonna go after the rust. So let me show you how I went through that cleaning process the other day. After thoroughly vacuuming this out, I got a hold of my trusty plastic razor blades and went in and started scraping all the excess. Then I got my chemicals and sprayer out. I have a method that I use. I've actually done a video on this. So if you're really interested in learning about the different types of brushes I use, the chemicals, the spray bottles, all the detail that goes into really cleaning an engine compartment like I'm doing here, be sure and check it out on my website. It covers a lot of unique features, including how I do this by using less than a gallon of water. So I'm actually able to clean this engine compartment in my shop with just a very small drip pan underneath the engine. I've decided to go ahead and remove this coolant pipe because it's corroded and I, it's going to be easier to paint out of the car. Plus, I want to check corrosion in the ends of the pipes where they go into the hoses. Also, I want to check corrosion over here on the water pump housing. Now, it's great you're going to get to see me use my favorite tool of the week live on this 240D. Have any of you ever tried to get these hoses off after they've been on for, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years? Well, enter the clamping tool, the larger size clamping tool that we make here in the shop. And watch how easy it is to get these hoses loose from the pipes. I'm going to grab it just right on the pipe and then I'm going to squeeze. You don't want to squeeze too hard, but then I'm going to twist it and eventually you can break it loose. And then I'll just back it up here so it's away from the pipe. Now I'm going to lose coolant here. I've got a drip pan on the floor and I can use this tool to also pull it off. I'll plug the hole here and I'm going to aim it right down on the drip pan. Now even though I've drained the radiator, look at how much coolant is in the block. This is the best way to drain the block after you've pulled that bottom radiator hose or removed the plug. Okay, I'm going to let this drain a little bit and then we'll come back and we'll remove this one and inspect that housing for corrosion. On this end, I'll just put the clamping tool right where the hose clamp goes. And I'm not going to squeeze too hard, just enough to grab the hose. And then I'm going to give it a good twist like that. Okay, there we go. And then I can back the clamping tool up 
and just work it right off. Look at that. It's probably a good thing that I'm removing this as a preventative measure because I want to treat and stop this corrosion on this housing nipple before it really gets bad. I'm going to be using a rust neutralizer to treat all the rust spots before I top coat them with an enamel. I'm going to use a satin black but I need to clean the excess rust off. I want to get the loose rust off. Now anytime you're using a rust neutralizer like this, you don't want to remove all the rust. This actually likes to stick to rust, okay? And what it does is it converts it to a black coating in preparation for top coat. It saves a lot of time. I mean, you know, somebody's gonna say, Kent, why don't you take the engine out of the car and sandblast it and paint it right? I don't want to spend that much time, but I do want the paint to stick. And if you just paint right over the rust without neutralizing it, you know, it's probably going to peel off in a year or two. So that's the goal. And I'm going to use Scotch-Brite pads to clean off the loose rust on all the rust spots. What I've done is I've taken a large pad of this purple Scotch-Brite pad and I've cut it into various sizes that I can work in and around some tight spots. And I'll start out right here just on top the brake booster. And all I'm going to do is rub it until I get all the loose scale and rust off. I'm not gonna rub it down to bare metal. Once again, these type of conversion products work best when they are able to stick to some rust and, and you don't wanna paint the areas that aren't rusty with this. So you're gonna have to get some small brushes, maybe some small acid brushes. And I'm gonna go ahead and go about cleaning all these rust spots up and then we'll come back and I'll show you how to apply this product. For most of the areas I'm cleaning, it doesn't take much. You can see that just rubbing the Scotch-Brite pad just for a few seconds to loosen up that rust really gets it off. So this will go fairly quickly and then we'll get ready to apply the neutralizer. The product I'm using today is Loctite Extend. I've used this over the years and I've had very good success with it. It's something that most of you viewers can find easily. Uh, you can actually buy this at Lowe's or some other hardware stores. The problem is it comes in a spray can. That's what's readily available on the market. And as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to be getting this on paint. It doesn't work in this application in a sprayable form. So what I do is I have these nice little two ounce containers. Now I have a whole bunch of these around the shop and these are so handy for detailing. In fact, it was hard to find this particular container with a flexible plastic and a good tight lid. I buy these by the hundreds now and I can offer these to you, the viewers. I have a kit now that includes a number of these and some brushes that you can use when you do this type of detailing. So what I'm gonna do is actually spray a small amount into this container. I'm going to get this down real close and kind of spray at an angle and it's just going to be a light little squeeze. And I'll try to spray it so it's not getting a lot in the air. Now, I don't think this stuff's real good to breathe. I'm doing this here in the shop and I'm going to stop and go outside and that's what I recommend you would do and we'll fill this up to about half an inch and then come back in and start applying it to those rust spots on the engine. Two coats are going to be required to get good adhesion. So you don't need to put it on real thick using an acid brush. I'm just going to coat the rusty area like this. I think you get the idea what I'm doing here. Otherwise, you don't need to sit and watch me apply this to every rust spot on the engine. But it'll be interesting. I'll let this dry and when we come back, you're gonna see it start to change color already just with the first coat. It applies, it applies nicely with an acid brush because you're just getting a, a thin coat on. I'm not gonna worry about getting it on the valve cover gasket here because we're gonna pull the valve cover pretty soon and, and adjust those valves and clean the cover up too. Okay, I'll keep working here and then I'll come back and show you what this looks like when we start to apply the second coat. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes since that first coat. That's about the maximum time you want to wait before you apply the second coat. You can see some of these areas are already turning dark and they're not totally black yet. 
But we're going to apply the second coat. I'm going to be a little careful not to get too much on. One of the tricks you can use if you're using an acid brush is dip it in to the extend and then take the excess and dab on a paper towel. And then when you apply it, it's not going to run down the side of the engine or the surface that you're working on. So I'll just take a little time here and apply this second coat to all these areas. And then tomorrow, we'll let it dry almost 24 hours and then we'll come back and you're gonna see quite a difference. And also, I put a little bit of water on one end of the rag here. If you get a little bit of excess on, the painted areas, just come in and wipe this off a little bit. You don't need the excess on the painted areas, and that really helps to keep it from building up, because if you put it on too thick and it's on the painted area, it'll be tacky and sticky the next day. It's been two days since I applied the rust conversion coating on the engine parts. You're going to get a chance to look at that. You know, you don't want to be in a hurry when you do this. You really want to make sure that Extend product dries thoroughly. If you top coat it with an enamel before it's dry, you're going to have some problems down the road. So let's take a look. You can see right here along the top of the engine block where the injectors are. Look at how that's all turned black. And over there on that area by where the fuel filter mounts, look, that was really rusty. Now you might say, well, Kent, you can just leave that like that. That's probably good enough for me. Well, it probably is, but unless you top coat that, it's going to start corroding, particularly if it gets some water on it and the water sits and gets into the steel. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get ready to paint here. Now, when you're talking about painting an engine with a brush, <laughs> it can be challenging. Number one, you've gotta have the right brushes and number two, you've got to have the right paint. Not all paint is created equal. And I'm going to show you this here. This is all satin black. <laughs> can you believe that? All satin black. Now you can see that all satin black is not created equal. I don't want to shine, but I also don't want flat. There's some of these here that are really flat, and there's some that claim to be semi-gloss that are just too shiny. So you want to get the right dullness to the paint, or otherwise it doesn't look right. You also want to get a paint that will flow out good. And then, of course, you want to get brushes, good brushes, not cheap brushes. Now, I modify some brushes. I take this one inch and cut it down to about three quarters of an inch. I like these brushes that have the angle with the, the straight point. And you're going to also need some smaller brushes. Now, we'll get into this in the next episode and show you some details of painting this, but I want you to just take a look at the brake booster. I went after that brake booster with this wedge-shaped brush, and I'm using my favorite. It's the Rust-Oleum Professional Semi-Gloss Black. What I like about that is it keeps flowing out even a day after you've applied it. It's fairly thick, so it doesn't want to run, and it goes on as smooth as any other paint I've used. You can see here right on the top of this oil cooler, I painted that two days ago, and look at how it's flowed out. Now, I didn't even sand it, so I wanted to give it some of that original patina, so I left some roughness underneath, but it has the right color consistency, and it flows good. Those are the two keys. So there's quite a bit of paint work yet to do on this engine, and we're going to keep working on it this week. So I'm going to leave the 240D at this point, because we don't have time to keep doing more work on this, because tomorrow night we have to post episode 5. And now for some other happenings around the shop. You know, I've mentioned in past videos that we can't just work on cars all the time because we have to produce products. And this is one that probably takes more of our time than any other one, and that's our injection pressure tester that you see right here. You know, I was laughing with my mechanic this week. I go back 10 years when we developed the first one, and I, after three months, nobody bought it. And I said, oh, no, that was a waste of time going through all that research and development. But let me tell you, since then, these things have really picked up, particularly now that we can offer this tester to test both the old mechanical fuel injected gas engines, all the diesel fuel injectors that are mechanical, and then it can also test all those CIS fuel injectors that are in all those <laughs> engines from about 1976 up to around 1993. And if you let those injectors go, you know, they're going to start 
gumming up. They're going to start leaking. They're going to start doing things that make your engine run poorly and you get poor fuel economy. So, you know, we're, we're shipping these things out the door. Look at what I'm doing right here today. Look at all these cans. We're getting ready to put them on the bench to weld on the nipples. And that allows us to attach a fluid reservoir to this hydraulic pressure tester. We're going to get on that today. And also, I've got to package up all the supplies that go with these. Now, this is the one that takes the most supplies. That's for the old mechanical fuel injected engines like Happier's. We call that the MFI fuel injection tester. <laughs> Look at this. I put green gloves in there. I put 20 bags in there. I put filters, adapters, bolts. We've got hose in there. You get 10 feet of hose for testing. And of course, I put in some warnings. You know, be sure and always follow my warnings, folks. So if you're wondering why we can't get that 240D done now, you know my favorite tool of the week is the clamping tool. Now, you've already got to see two of these in use on the 240D earlier in this video. This one here is the one we just developed. This is for removing that stubborn fuel injector return hose on those older diesels. There's a couple others we've already developed a number of years ago. The first one was this particular clamping tool that we used to get on to spark plug ignition wires, particularly like on the OM102 and M103 engine, where some of those ignition wires can be really tough to get off. And then finally, this is one we just recently developed here, and you got to see this in use pulling those coolant hoses off the 240D engine. But you know, this, this is a great tool. It was originally developed here in our shop for holding fuel injectors like this while we prepared them for overhaul. You can hold both ends and when you go through the whole cleaning process, you can see how handy it is to have something like this that you can grab these with, particularly like if you've got these on a wire wheel and you're cleaning the rust off the injector housings. But this has become one of my favorite tools because I found there's other reasons as well, like holding on to a punch. How many of you have banged up your hand or fingers while trying to hold on a punch and hammering it with a hammer? Well, now I can grab a hold of it with this clamping tool like this and hammer away on either a pin punch or a chisel without hurting my hand. Now, those are the tools right there that we sell, but we also have a number of clamping tools that we've developed here to use in the shop for production. This one is used to hold the lug bolt when we cut the lug bolt off on the chop saw. Don't ask me why we cut lug bolts off. Some of you might be able to guess, okay? Now this one, we used to cut the pipe. We can grab a hold of the pipe that we use for the pop tester and hold it down tight and then get the chop saw and cut it without getting your hand in or near that cut off wheel. This one is used to hold the same pipe on the sander to clean the edges and to get it smoothed out in prep preparation for welding. And then we've got numerous other clamping tools that we've made here to use in and around the shop for holding various items when we're doing our manufacturing. And now for the questions and answers of the week. The first one is not really a question. It's kind of a request, but it comes from a question I answered last week when somebody said, hey, I would buy your LED bulbs if they weren't bright white. I don't like bright white. I want some warm white, the yellow white color. So guess what? We went to work. I found the bulb that I think he is going to want. And let me show you these right now on the bench. You can see the difference. The bright white is very cool, very bright. The warm white is a much more yellow cast to it, and it's a little bit dimmer. And along with this, I decided I've got to find a way to dim the maximum brightness of these LEDs because some of them are really bright. I mean, just staring at them on the bench kind of almost blinded me. So I figured it out and I shot a video yesterday. I spent about three hours going through the procedure of how to correctly install these LEDs, modifying the wire connectors so they don't loosen up in the holders, how to get the holders rebuilt if you're having a problem, what about the dimmer switch, and then finally I showed you my tricks to modifying the LED lights if you don't like the maximum brightness. So we have a new kit on my website. You're going to get a number of LEDs of both colors so you can do some experimenting on your own. I'd love to hear back from you. For those of you who get these LEDs 
and experiment around with changing the maximum brightness, okay? Now number two prompted me to think about maybe developing a new kit, okay? <laughs> and it goes like this. I am a massive Mercedes enthusiast and have over 10 at the moment, eight of which are over 20 to 30 years old. And I've always wondered, what are those two round circle things when you open the glove box like in a W123 or W124? They look like cup holders from an aircraft. What are they for? Thank you, Ken. Let's go out to the car now. I've got a W126 sitting outside, and I think I can answer the question sitting inside and showing this to you. Let's open up the glove box and take a closer look at what he's talking about. Here you see those two indentations in the back of the glove box door. I've looked at these for years too, and I've tried to use it as a cup holder. But look at this, you stick a water bottle. I remember one time I was trying to drive with a water bottle like that, <laughs> it fell over, you know, and spilled water all over the carpets. I'm not sure what the engineers were thinking here, but if you do get the proper size 12 ounce cup, it does fit in there. Maybe this was a picnic tray when you parked the car and wanted to eat on the side of the road. Because I know the German engineer said, no, no drinking while you're driving cause an accident. So we want to avoid accidents so we can park along the side of the road and you'll just have a place to put your juice or your coffee while you're taking a rest at the interstate rest stop. But look what happens when you try to put a 16 ounce cup. That's really dangerous. So this got me thinking about the idea for another kit. Oh, I could come up with a modification here, a little sub cup holder that you could glue right on here. You can still close the door. And then when you put your 12 ounce cup in, see it's gonna stick right in there. And then of course, when you're driving, it's not gonna flip out unless you drive really hard. But you know, I got to thinking about this. I don't need to come up with a kit. I think people can make their own. You can use a, something like this. This is a plastic cup that just happens to be just the right size. Look at that. And you push it down on the bottom and it sticks right in the, in the bottom of that plastic cup and I could glue that on there with a little silicone so I could get it off in the future but that's probably what I'm going to do for this car folks that's going to be my solution for a cup holder in the W126. Number three I'm thinking of buying an older Mercedes I want something that I can work on myself like before the age of all the computer gadgets what model or models do you recommend Ken? Well this is an opinion question but because I have so much experience with these 1986 to 1995 Mercedes, that some of the things I can share with you are more fact and they are opinion. So what I've done is I've set out to do a video series on buying these cars during that period. I've completed part one and part two where I talk about the reasons you should own one and the reasons you shouldn't own one. So if you haven't seen those yet, I want you to catch up on those. And to answer this question, Watch these videos over the next three or four weeks and I think I can give you a pretty good idea what you might want to purchase. Number four, I have a 1990 W126 with an OM617 diesel conversion. It has ABS brakes and they work very well, but the brakes emit a low frequency chatter when in gear and the brakes fully applied at very low speed when parking. The noise stops instantly when the brake pedal is released and it does not happen while driving above parking lot speeds. What could cause this? I've done a couple videos on this. I'm not gonna answer it here because the videos will kind of explain. There's a couple things you should check. So I'm gonna put a link in the description of this video that'll take you to those videos I've done on troubleshooting ABS brakes. Number five, this is from Ring-a-Ding. Kent, is the beast ever going to come back? I love the series. Well, currently the beast is going into hibernation. And another, Viewer asks, Kent, are you going to ever paint the beast? Because it really needs a paint job. No, I'm not going to paint the beast. The beast is going to stay in its original form, as I found it. <laughs> Number six, is that car having headlight wiper issues? Now, he's referring to my new 124 coupe, an E320, that I featured in part one in my series on buying an 86 to 95 Mercedes. You notice that one of the headlight wipers is crooked. Now you're pretty sharp to be able to see that. Obviously he was staring at the car and obviously has some headlight wiper issues. And he wants to know if there's any tips to fix these headlight wipers. And this would be a longer question than I have time to answer. Maybe in one of my series 
episodes on buying an 86 to 95 Mercedes all go over headlight wipers, but I actually noticed that myself, and the first time I operated the wipers, they operated fine, and they went right back to center, so I don't know why it was particularly up on the right side, okay? And number seven, Kent, I've watched all your videos. I have two 1986 Mercedes. I have a 420 SEL and a 560 SEC. The 420 is my daily driver. I would like to replace the timing chain on my 560. They are used vehicles and I want to slowly restore them part by part. Can you tell me what major mistakes people make in replacing a timing chain and what to look for in making an improvement to the engine such as this? The alternative is to take it to my mechanic and have them do it. And that's expensive. You're right, that's very expensive. I've replaced quite a few timing chains in these V8 engines. And I've written a manual on it. It's called Preventing V8 Catastrophic Engine Failure. Because it's not only the timing chain, it's the guide rails. Some of these other problems uh, that you need to deal with if you own one of these V8 engines. So I'm gonna put a link in the description of this video and take you right to that manual on my website. You know, there are some things you need to be concerned about when you do this job yourself, okay? This is number eight from a call -in. He says, hi, Kent, I have a short and sweet one for you. Now I'm gonna be very suspicious when people say, Ken, I've got a short and sweet question for you, and here's this question. Can an OM621 camshaft be installed in an OM616 engine? My cam is worn, but I can get my hands on an OM621 in good shape. If the swap can in fact be done, any tips in terms of doing the job? I have done research, but still have a hard time conceptualizing the process, as this will be my first foray into major engine timing work. Okay, Colin, number one, I don't know. I've never compared a 621 to a, a 616. There's probably enough difference, subtle differences that you wouldn't even want to try the swap. Just try to find a good used 616 camshaft, okay? And as far as tips on doing the job and doing it safely, that's not a short and sweet one. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very long one. And I've got some information on my website. I've got some manuals I've written on this project. One thing that you do need to be aware of, I'll just give you the number one major tip, and this is the number one reason people get into trouble when they start changing their camshafts. And as you study more and learn more about this, Always make sure you get your engine up on top dead center on number one with all the timing marks lined up before you remove the camshaft. Okay, so that's it for the questions this week. You know, this video may run a little bit longer than the previous videos. I would like your feedback if you think the videos are getting too long. I know sometimes you might get tired of listening to me go on and on and on, particularly on this question and answer session. Give me a little feedback. Let me know if you'd like to see more questions or fewer questions. For next week's episode, I'm gonna to continue to work on the engine and the engine compartment of that 240D. We've got a lot more work to do, but we'll kind of fill you in on the work as we progress. I'll probably carry that over into the next episode beyond that as well. But I'm also gonna start on my newly acquired E320 Coupe. Just recently driving this car, it became very obvious that it needs new shock absorbers, okay? And it probably needs some other things. So we're gonna roll this into the shop we're gonna start the 2,000 hour inspection or what I call the 2,000 hour post-purchase inspection. And by the way, if you wanna know how to tell if your shock absorbers are bad, I'm posting a separate video showing how to do both a bounce test and a road test to determine the condition of the shock absorbers in your own bins. It looks like we really have our work cut out for us this week. Not only do we have these two cars that we need to work on, but we had a huge number of orders come in over the weekend during our Halloween sale. So if you've placed one of those orders, I just want you to know we really appreciate you customers out there supporting Mercedes Source, which in turn supports this channel. So stay tuned for next week's episode.